Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon fireside chat with Dr. Mark Carney, UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, and UK Prime Minister Johnson's Finance Advisor for COP26, and Anne-Marie Hubert, East Market Segment Leader at Ernst & Young Canada. The theme of this session is the future of sustainable investing. Mark Carney is regarded, and deservedly so, as one of the most prominent central bank governors and economists of our time, as well as a tireless and inspiring leader and advocate for climate action, mitigation of wealth inequality, and sustainable investing. Most of us will remember his outstanding work as governor of the Bank of Canada from 2008 until 2013, when he helped country go through one of the most difficult and challenging economic crises. Following this mandate, he was appointed as the governor of the Bank of England from 2013 to 2020. Mark is the first non-Briton to be appointed to the role since the bank was established in 1694. He was also chairman of the Financial Stability Board, and prior to these positions, Mark worked at Goldman Sachs as well as the Canadian Department of Finance. His expertise and knowledge of the global economic system are only matched by his personal qualities, particularly his unwavering quest for the common good and a deep sense of public service. In this regard, we are privileged to have Mark as a member of the advisory committee of the Charter for Canadian Universities Investing to Address Climate Change, an initiative that was launched in 2020 by the University of Toronto and by my university, the University of McGill, and it is signed by 15 Canadian universities. Mark will be joined by Anne-Marie Hubert, a trailblazer and passionate leader well-known in the socioeconomic field in Montreal and internationally. Anne-Marie Hubert's illustrious uh, career includes her leadership. Je vais le dire en français parce qu'on se parle toujours en français, Anne-Marie et moi. Alors, elle s'illustre par son leadership, son audace et sa vision innovatrice notamment chez Ernst Young Canada, mais également au sein de nombreuses organisations qui ont pu bénéficier de son expertise et de son énergie. Elle est reconnue pour son humanisme, sa promotion inlassable de l'inclusion et de la diversité et sa contribution exceptionnelle en faveur de l'avancement des femmes. Encore récemment, Anne-Marie s'est jointe à l'équipe de Projet Prospérité, une initiative pan-canadienne fondée pour atténuer les impacts de la pandémie sur les Canadiennes qui en subissent les conséquences de manière disproportionnée. Le thème de l'échange d'aujourd'hui sera la carboneutralité, aussi appelée zéro émission nette ou net zéro. Nous sommes encore loin de l'atteinte de cet objectif ambitieux à l'échelle mondiale. Il s'agit pourtant d'une condition essentielle afin de réussir la transition vers une économie durable, limiter la hausse des températures et surtout assurer la meilleure qualité de vie possible au plus grand nombre à l'échelle internationale. As principal of McGill, I'm pleased to say that our university is working hard to be part of the solution. Over the past years, we have made significant pro progress in establishing a comprehensive sustainability strategy and this in all aspects of what we do, teaching, research, and operation, as well as developing a framework for sustainable investing. I know we're all eager to hear the exchanges between Anne-Marie and Marc, and so sans plus tarder, please welcome our very special guests, Marc Carnet and Anne-Marie Hubert. Merci, Suzanne. Bonjour, Marc. C'est un plaisir de te revoir. Bienvenue à la conférence de Montréal. Toi et merci, moi, on, merci, on pourrait faire cet entretien en français, 
Mais vu ta présence, il y a pas mal de participants d'un peu partout au pays et d'ailleurs dans le monde. Donc, si ça te convient, on va faire l'intro dans la langue de Molière et euh, les questions-réponses dans la langue de Shakespeare. C'est parfait. OK. Donc, Mike, euh... uh, just about a year ago, l'année dernière, tu faisais les commentaires suivants. Le défi climat est passé du département de marketing à l'ensemble des comités exécutifs et des PDG et des conseils des entreprises. Les entreprises doivent modifier leur stratégie pour faire face à la COVID-19, mais sont conscients du fait qu'ils doivent aussi intégrer des objectifs carboneutres pour 2050. L'objectif de carboneutralité doit s'appuyer sur la science, euh, donc s'inspirer des lignes directrices du cadre d'information du Task Force on, financial climate, on climate Financial Disclosure, ce qui n'était pas tout le temps fait de façon uniforme l'année passée. On a fait du progrès, mais il nous reste du travail à faire. Chaque entreprise, chaque banque, chaque assureur doit ajuster son modèle d'affaires en fonction des risques liés au changement climatique. Tu nous parlais de 34 banques centrales, membres du Conseil de la stabilité financière, qui travaillent ensemble pour réaliser cette transformation des marchés financiers. Pour intégrer le risque climatique de façon systémique dans les décisions financières. Puis soutenir la transition pour les entreprises qui utilisent euh, des énergies fossiles ou qui en produisent. Tu faisais état des progrès significatifs par plusieurs États, en commençant par la Chine, les, 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 comme de raison l'Angleterre, euh, l'Union européenne. Puis, il y avait des avancées importantes aux États-Unis également, en Australie. L'État de New York avait fait des avancées très importantes. C'est important d'avoir de la réglementation pour accélérer ce cercle vertueux. You wanted commitments by COP26 on a few critical building blocks to address climate risk. A pathway for globally consistent mandatory disclosures required by investors to integrate climate risk in financial decisions. You wanted central banks engaged in the stress testing. You wanted the transition answers for citizens, a financial system that requires investment money to go to the right transition plans and to the businesses to take the lead because they want to address the needs of investors and the expectations of their customers or employees to trust that they're on the right path for the transition. Moi, je t'écoutais, on était des milliers à t'écouter. On était tous d'accord. Mais on ne voyait pas comment ça pouvait bouger assez vite. COP26, ça s'en vient, là. Comment tu allais arriver à faire tous ces progrès-là? Donc, pour beaucoup d'entre nous, la principale surprise, là, depuis 12 mois, depuis 10-12 mois, c'est la rapidité l'accélération du changement au cours des douze derniers mois. Quand on regarde tous les joueurs clés du monde de la finance euh, avec l'initiative Diosco qui travaille pour Common Disclosure Standards, avec la fondation NFRS, là, puis on s'en vient, là, ça devrait être annoncé avant la COP26. Quand on regarde tous ces gens-là euh, qui veulent rapidement un standard climat, quand on regarde le Roadmap for Climate du Financial Stability Board, puis les communiqués des leaders du G20, du G7, ils disent « Oh my God, il a réussi. Euh, » Mais il reste du chemin à faire, mais le progrès qu'on voulait faire pour la COP26, on est là. Donc, force est de constater que l'infrastructure est en train de se mettre en place pour que le système financier intègre le risque climat dans ses décisions. But given this new reality in the global financial markets, how can we help businesses Develop their roadmap for credibly getting to net zero by 2050 at the latest. Parfait, bonne question. Uh, comme toujours, Amélie. Et, et puis je puis je commençais en français et, et de dire à Suzanne Fortier, uh, merci pour ces mots uh, uh, trop, trop généreux et uh, surtout pour uh, son leadership uh, de l'université de McGill et des autres universités. Uh, 
enfin, cet objectif essentiel de carbone neutre. Et, euh, et vous aussi, Henry, euh, également euh, avec euh, votre travail. Euh, vous avez raison, euh, nous avons fait beaucoup de progrès euh, lorsque le Royaume-Uni a accédé à la présidence de, de la COP26, il y a une an et demi, euh, en effet. Euh, mais à ce moment-là, les pays responsables pour 30 des émissions mondiales ont mis en place des objectifs de carbone neutre, net zero. Maintenant, ce chiffre est 75 euh, Et par conséquent, il y a un, un impact sur les entreprises et le secteur financier. Et euh, comme vous le savez, euh, notre objectif pour le secteur financier privé est de bâtir une carte pour assurer que chaque décision financière prend en compte le changement climatique. En effet, le, une des rôles du secteur financier sera de distinguer entre ces entreprises qui, qui feront partie de la solution du climat et celles qui numéreront une partie de le problème, du problème. Pardon. Um, so, Your, that brings to your question, and maybe just to underscore some of that progress, I just want to repeat a couple of things because I'm happy to see it. The IFRS Foundation for Mandatory Disclosure that can cover 130 countries once that is up and running. And that standard, the objective for that standard is by the middle of next year. Uh, the G7 committing to mandatory disclosure uh, at the summit uh, in Cornwall this past summer. That number of central banks uh, who are bringing climate risk management to the center of finance, rising from the original eight into the 30s, and now over 90 of the central banks covering more than 85% of the global emissions. So this really is going to the sector of finance. And as you say, with your question, what does it mean for our businesses? Uh, it means a few things. One, it means this question, this core question of what is your plan? Uh, what is your plan as a business for net zero? Uh, will be asked with increased frequency and specificity uh, uh, in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Uh, it means that uh, the financial sector will need to work with businesses uh, to get capital to those who, as I said a moment ago, who are going to be part of the solution. In other words, those who are going to invest to reduce their emissions. Um, I think you know we all know who look at this closely that this is Uh, very capital intensive. Uh, overall estimates move around a bit, but uh, I haven't seen any credible estimate of the scale of investment that does not involve a doubling of the scale of uh, energy investment um, from current around $2 trillion dollars a year levels to about four, perhaps $5 trillion a year by the middle of this decade and extending out uh, uh, for uh, the next 25 years there beyond. Uh, so, um, It goes to having a plan for the transition. It, it goes to all aspects of emissions. So obviously scope one, scope two, uh, but also scope three where they're material. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is data intensive work, um, uh, but uh, the work has to start now. The other thing it means for companies and for those who finance them is understanding um, what are the implications for that company Um, or that financing, uh, by extension, what are the implications of success? Uh, in other words, what happens if uh, we, as, uh, as the world, move towards our objective of one and a half degrees? Uh, which assets could become stranded in those scenarios? Which assets and business strategies will benefit uh, in those uh, scenarios? So increasingly, uh, and, and many of them are joining us uh, virtually at the Conference de Montréal, uh, boards of directors, senior managers, uh, CEOs, this is a core question uh, that you will, you will need to answer uh, as part of your strategy. Um, obviously, many things have to go right in order for us to achieve that objective. Uh, but uh, we, none of us want uh, financial institutions in trouble or businesses failing if, if society succeeds. So uh, it's the core of a strategy to move towards net zero. Um, and it's also managing and understanding uh, where the risks are uh, if, uh, if the world moves, uh, moves smartly towards the objective, if I can put it that way, uh, as well as, of course, what we would all traditionally think of the risks, uh, which are associated with failure, where physical risks from climate change would dominate. So, Mark, you made reference to the capital intensity. A lot of money will be required. 
at a point in time in history where government leaders have to invest in the economic recovery and at the same time have to invest in the energy transition. So public sector money will never be enough. Like we could expect yeah. our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, it's not gonna be enough to pay for this. We'll need a combination of private sector savings and public sector money um, to, to combine, to, to align to common goals, common objectives, and that's to a certain extent a lot of the, the, the change you're trying to affect. So can you share your perspective on progress made to finance the infrastructure and the innovation required for the transition? Yes, um, so there's, there's a couple of aspects to that. First, you're absolutely right. The vast majority of this money will, come, will have to come from the private sector or we won't get the job done, uh, to be absolutely clear. Um, and it should be, uh, you know, if, if people doubted it before, the experience of the last uh, year, 18 months, uh, would have reinforced the fact that we need to invest and grow in order to get to net zero. I mean, in the end, with shutting down large proportions of our economies for valid, very good reasons because of the health crisis, we only just met collectively the 7% reduction in emissions. It's clear that we need this investment in order to get there. So, and that investment will largely come from the private sector. But the public sector plays an absolutely essential role in setting the conditions for that investment. And it's, it's a point that uh, Janet Yellen and I made uh, both this time last year in a, in a major study for the G30 around the impact of credible and predictable climate policies on business investment and how essential they are in order to get that investment flowing. And, and let me be more specific, the types of climate policies that deliver that are, for example, what we have in Canada with uh, a legislated carbon price rising uh, to $170 by 2030. Uh, that's you know, date certain, it's a clear path, it changes the economics of various investments today um, and businesses can start moving. It includes things like um, in the United Kingdom, uh, uh, about 12 months ago, similar timing, uh, the government there uh, decreed that no new internal combustion engine vehicles would be sold after 2030. Other countries have adopted something similar, slightly different dates. Um, but the UK made that declaration. What we have seen with a lag of about six months is some quite major investments uh, up and down the supply chain in the UK in zero emission vehicle. Uh, production and not surprising also charging infrastructure. In other words, these policy decisions, these uh, providing direction either through price or regulation, in some cases uh, through government support, um, uh, far enough off in the future that business can react and adjust to it, but close enough in the, uh, in, um, uh, in the horizon so that they must react. Uh, there's not a, a, a delayed reaction. And uh, we see this in, um, in general in the economy, but also uh, in very specific sectors and uh, sectors that are well known in, in Quebec, uh, across Canada, around, uh, you know, really around uh, uh, the globe, around um, uh, the hydrogen economy as, uh, as a specific example, uh, work on direct air or other forms of carbon capture being uh, other examples where this role between government clarity about the the, the trajet, the, the the pathway, and and supporting um, uh, policy uh, is essential to getting the types of investment that we're really going to need in a timely enough way uh, from the private sector uh, to move forward. Two areas of mega learning in the last few years, which we're doing in climate and COVID, where the globe is learning together and we're making progress together. <laughs> Fascinating. Yes. So the need for a credible mar a carbon market to accelerate the transition has always been part of your game plan. So where are we at on this topic and what would you like to see next? Yeah, uh, well, this is, this is and I, I like, again, I like the way you phrase it. It's part of the game plan. It's certainly not, it's not central to the game plan. And so just to dimension that uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, you, we all hear a lot of headlines around the carbon market or the carbon offset market, to be uh, clearer, uh, sometimes called the carbon credit market. But in the end, this market is small. Um, it's small, fragmented, var variable quality. All those factors are related, of course. Um, and last year, even with quite strong growth, it was really only about a billion dollars of trades uh, per year. Now, 
this market, we think that properly structured, so with high integrity, I'll come back to that, uh, is a market that is a hundred to $150 billion a year market uh, and the latter part of this decade, um, and could be responsible for preserving up to 10% of our limited carbon budget. So we only have about 30, uh, 32 gigatons left uh, on the one and a half degree uh, uh, carbon budget. So that's part of what it can deliver. It certainly also can deliver very large benefits for biodiversity, for indigenous peoples around the world, um, and other knock-on benefits for economies. Now, where are we in terms of that development? Um, again, about uh, starting about 18 months ago, um, we looked at the market and we decided that it needed root and branch reform. Um, so struck a, um, a, a committee uh, working group, really, uh, led by Bill Winters, uh, who's the CEO of Standard Chartered, uh, and Annette Nazareth, the former SEC commissioner, um, a broad range of stakeholders, over 400 institutions, uh, many from the private sector, but many NGOs, market plumbing experts, others, all working on this process, uh, develop, uh, developed, uh, you know, socialized, uh, took comments and, and, and laid out the final blueprint for this market um, in uh, the summer of this year. Uh, we're, they're just in the process of um, populating the governance structure of this market because it's critical that there is uh, a global governance structure of not just a board of directors, but a group that sets the core integrity principles for this market and then polices that going forward. Um, uh, those announcements will come uh, within weeks uh, of those individuals. And uh, from my understanding, I'm not directly involved, but uh, the quality of institutions and individuals is first rate, and they are from around the world, from the advanced and emerging world. So that's very encouraging. On top of that, uh, both London and Singapore have signaled uh, their intention to be core hubs for this market. It, as I think you know, it ultimately will be largely an over-the-counter uh, market, but there will be exchange-traded aspects and, and, and core expertise for that. Uh, and there's reasonable prospect of uh, initial uh, pilot trades uh, developing um, in advance of the market formally ramping up once the governance group has done all of its work formally ramping up later uh, next year. So it's very encouraging. One of the things we're seeing is the knock-on effect in these um, uh, legacy markets, if I could put it this way, or satellite markets, the uh, level of activity uh, is, uh, is moving very rapidly. Um, and uh, the explosion of interest in this. Um, and let me make one last point, which uh, you, you, you rightly referenced in your last question. You know, most of the investment will be uh, for the overall transition will be for the private sector. Well, actually, if you look at this carbon market, let's say it's 150 billion a year dollars, um, most of that, three quarters to potentially 90 percent, uh, will be into the emerging uh, and developing economies. And this is uh, you know, potentially a huge flow of capital, which will help with their own transition uh, and very importantly, preserve nature um, and carbon um, as, as part of the consequence. So, yes, absolutely a necessary part of the solution. Uh, great work going on um, that um, uh, is, is, is having a real impact, I, I, I will soon have a real impact on the ground. Mark, another point where you were always crystal clear, the financial system will have to finance the transition, will have to support the transition. Um, we need credible transition uh, to net zero transition plans, but uh, if you have to drop certain assets because of climate or because of digital adoption, we can write off the assets, but we cannot write off the people who work for those companies. We need to invest in their, uh, their, their retraining, retooling, upskilling. So how do you see the financial system and multilateral institutions tackle this issue of divestment? A, a critical, critical point. And in some respects, it goes back a bit to your first point and I'm gonna bring it into some of the work that's being done. Um, uh, the first is we need to develop, the collective we need to develop a credible uh, and transparent way for responsible investors and lenders to um, run off, uh, finance the runoff of stranded assets. So, I mean, there, there is a time path for various assets that uh, cannot make it to their the end of their entire um, 
working life, if I can put it that way, uh, because that would be inconsistent with, uh, with, with the overall objective of getting to net zero, society's overall objective of getting to net zero. Um, but you need responsible owners who can manage that so that uh, it is consistent uh, with that. Um, and one of the things that we're working as part of um, uh, this uh, group, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which we put together, and I actually haven't mentioned it yet. Normally, I don't get this long into uh, the discussion without mentioning GFANS. Um, this is the group of banks, asset managers, uh, asset owners, others, uh, uh, many in this virtual room, uh, including from Quebec. Um, uh, $88 trillion of balance sheet that's committing to net zero. Um, and they're doing more than commitments. Um, they're short-term uh, decarbonization plans and others, but they're working on exactly these types of issues. So how can there be responsible defeasance of assets, if I can put it that way? Uh, so that's a work stream that's being developed or work that's being developed. Uh, what's being asked of company net zero plans? And then very importantly, to get to aspects of just transition, um, is um, uh, in, for emerging and developing uh, economies working on country platforms. Uh, so financing that includes multilateral and public financing, as well as private financing that's consistent with the types of transitions that are necessary uh, in, those, in those economies. And so to make them much more consistent, but also to scale them up dramatically. And it's something we're working hard at uh, for COP, that, that framework and that organizing. Um, last point I'll make is, you know, this is as true and, um, you know, very true in our, our economies, advanced economies. Uh, and it, it's, it's why we need a, a, a comprehensive strategy from governments um, on uh, the transition. It's why we need forward guidance on um, the horizons for various technologies, both those that are coming in to become, you know, core to our energy systems and more broadly our economies. Uh, but also for those uh, technologies um, uh, and others that will transition, um, uh, not just for the flows of finance, but also um, to ensure that the resources of a country, and I think Canada in this case, um, that are being properly uh, dedicated to, um, as you say, to retrain, to build the industries of the future, to reinvest in the areas uh, that are undergoing those adjustments. Uh, and now's the time to do it. It's not at a cliff edge point down the road where uh, there is a sharper uh, a sharper adjustment. Uh, this needs time and, uh, and and absolutely can be done. And that last point I'd make is, again, I'll use Canada as, uh, as the example. Um, we have the resources collectively between what's collected in governments, what's what's uh, the cash flows of businesses in order to make sure that this can that this is done. Mark, I have a, a non-expected question. My clock doesn't work. I don't have a watch. My iPhone is on my, in my purse. I don't know how much time we have left. <laughs> <laughs> We're like massively over. It's, no, that's very funny. It is, uh, this one I can answer. I can be quicker on this. We, uh, we have uh, four minutes. We have five four minutes. Four minutes left. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, <laughs> that's very good. So uh, many of us had the privilege <laughs> to, uh, to really read your book. Uh, uh, values building a better world for all. Quite inspiring. Uh, philosophy and economy joining forces for a better world. I want to say a few words on, on maybe the later part of the book, your dreams for this country. Well, I think, uh, I think it's building off of what we've been talking about, Anne Marie, which is that, you know, the book goes through, as you'd expect, someone who's still got the scars, as, as was referenced at the start from, uh, uh, the financial crisis, um, uh, what happens when we, we lose the balance between value markets, in other words, and values of society? And that certainly happened globally. Fortunately, Canada had retained uh, that balance, and so we were able to weather the storm. Um, but it goes on to look at, um, well, how can we use the market? How can we organize the market? Um, to deliver the values of society? And uh, we've been talking about climate as, as one of the examples. Uh, and that's certainly core for what uh, what Canada, Quebec uh, has ha have to do and have to organize ourselves. So as a society as a whole, we deliver it and for all. But you know, at the same time, um, we're as this sustainable uh, transformation is undergoing um, uh, or starting, uh, we're going through a digital revolution um, uh, with enormous impacts on uh, all of us in terms of how we work, consume, live. 
Uh, and, and that's both, both very positive, but also quite disruptive. And I think one of the things that the, uh, the book tries to go through in the latter part in terms of country strategies is we need a, you know, a, a strategy for sustainability. We also need a strategy on, on digital um, to make sure that we're harnessing the power of these technologies to be digital by design, to use digital, to maximize our opportunity set. I'll come back to that quickly, as opposed to have what normally happens, quite frankly, when you have these big technological shifts, which is it takes decades for them to shake out. And uh, normally um, during the initial periods, um, you know, those who have this, the right skills going in benefit, obviously, uh, but also those who have capital benefit, but more broadly, um, uh, workers more, you know, more broadly, it, it, it takes a, a longer time to adjust. And I don't think, you know, that's not right, nor is it, nor is it necessary. So we need to be much more deliberate about it. And um, so the book has some ideas about what Canada could do on that. Won't surprise you that part, you know, give my background, I sort of start with things we can do in the financial sector that can help improve access to finance, including for small, medium-sized enterprises. But it extends as well to um, how we can influence the structure of the global system, um, freer trade for our, for our smaller businesses, freer trade for services, where we're very strong, where both of those areas, by the way, where uh, there's real gender benefits um, uh, to the economic strategy. Um, but also, I would, I would say as well, to kind of bring it full circle, and now that I'm watching, now that I know I'm watching the time, we're I've <laughs> almost finished it off, uh, to bring it full circle back to the sustainability side. Um, you know, this is, this is an expertise we have from a technological perspective, you know, from our great energy companies to our startups, uh, as well as from a financial perspective. And I know that... Uh, uh, you know, our, our, our big financial institutions, um, including the large ones um, in Montreal, are, are, are absolutely committed to this agenda and, and, and can help build, are helping to build the system we've been discussing today. So in all of those ways, we can take these big shifts and direct them for the benefit of, uh, of all Canadians. So Mark, on behalf of my children, of your children, I'd like to thank the leaders put you in roles that allowed you to lead us. I'd like to thank the people that work around you uh, that follow your leadership. And I'd like to thank you for the leadership you exhibit to drive the society in a different place and to help us build a better world for all. Thank you so much. That's very kind. Thank you very much, Emily. My pleasure as always. <laughs>